take for granted the earth beneath our feet. But is it as safe as you might think? Around the world, millions live under the threat of an earthquake disaster, killing thousands and destroying entire cities in seconds. Earthquakes don't kill people, buildings do. Naked Science asks the question, what can science tell us about the fury of our angry Earth? In the last century, more than one million people died in earthquakes. Over the next century, it's feared that number could increase tenfold. Earthquakes really pose little direct danger to the human body. People can't be shaken to death in a quake. The real hazard is when an earthquake strikes in a heavily populated urban area. Can science do anything to protect us? Might we one day be able to predict the quakes? Or are we at the mercy of the awesome power of nature? Our quest begins by going back to basics, looking at what triggers an earthquake in the first place. Earthquakes are the sudden, explosive release of enormous pressures that build up within the crust of the planet. To understand how such pressures are caused, just look deep into the Earth. Its crust is formed from huge oceanic and continental blocks, called tectonic plates, and they rest on the mantle that lies below. The plates are constantly, but very slowly, shifting. They move some two inches a year, driven by movements in the mantle below and building up vast pressures along the plate margins. Meet Dr. Lucy Jones, scientist in charge of the Southern California Earthquake Hazards Team. There are 12 major plates that we look at on the surface of the Earth, and any place where they come together, is going to be a place we have a concentration of earthquakes. Over time, the edges where tectonic plates grind past each other deform and break, creating cracks known as faults. Eventually, pressures reach a critical point when rocks on each side of the fault slip and snap into a new position. The way to understand this is actually snapping your fingers. When you snap your fingers, you put a surface together, you have friction that keeps it sliding, you push hard enough, you overcome the friction, and we release a wave that makes the ground vibrate. And the bigger the surface is, the more energy you've got, and the bigger the earthquake you have. The spot on the Earth's surface above where the snap happens is called the epicenter. Once triggered, the earthquake is stopping for no one. It can travel along the entire fault line. It's a bit like tearing a napkin. Earthquakes have to happen over a surface. They don't happen at the epicenter. But they begin at the epicenter. And then you have a rupture that moves down the fault. Now if I pull like this, it's too strong and it won't break. I put a crack in it. And then once I've got it started, I've got a rupture that'll move down the napkin. Once started, an earthquake just keeps on rolling, releasing all that pressure between the plates. The longer the fault, the bigger the earthquake. To have a really devastating earthquake, you need to have a very large event, very near to a very large number of people. As the global population grows ever faster, more and more people are living in cities. 
the population of Los Angeles has tripled in the last 60 years. Such growth leads to what scientists term the megacity, defined as having a population in excess of 8 million people. In the world today, there are almost 15 megacities. Some, such as Los Angeles, Tokyo, and Mexico City, are under direct threat from an earthquake. Close to 100 million city dwellers face the constant danger of an earthquake disaster. And still more people pour in every year. As the buildings get higher and higher, so does the danger. Earthquakes don't kill people. Buildings do. And we have many cities of the world that are located near some of these big faults. And proximity can be 90% of the game in earthquakes. When you're right on top of the earthquake, you see a lot more shaking than even a small distance away. So having the fault in the city is the recipe for real disaster. If a large earthquake was to hit any of these megacities, the destruction could be catastrophic, potentially claiming millions of lives. And major cities have been hit by large earthquakes in the past. 1906 in San Francisco or 1923 in Tokyo, we can see that the biggest earthquakes do an overwhelming level of damage and we have many, many more people living in both those cities right now than we did 100 years ago. If financial centers such as these were hit by a large quake today, the entire global economy would be shaken. A natural disaster leading to an economic downward spiral that could last for months or years. So it's more critical than ever that science seeks a reliable way of predicting where and when the next big strike will occur. One region has had more large earthquakes than anywhere else. The Pacific Rim circles the entire Pacific tectonic plate, from the South China Sea across to California and down to South America. Volcanoes along its length give it the nickname the Ring of Fire. The largest earthquake ever recorded happened here. In 1960, the awesome magnitude 9.5 quake shook southern Chile, triggering enormous landslides and killing over 2,000 people. How powerful is a quake of that size? The answer is terrifying. The magnitude of an earthquake is measured using a system called the Richter scale, which ranges from 1 to 10. With each higher number, the power increases tenfold. A magnitude 5.5 quake, for instance, is more powerful than a Hiroshima-sized nuclear bomb. Yet an earthquake measuring 9.5 on the Richter scale is incredibly 100,000 times more powerful than the 5.5. An earthquake that big is more than a million times as powerful as the Hiroshima blast of 1945. A 9.5 striking a megacity could bring total destruction, upping the ante for scientists looking to predict the next big one. But before scientists have any chance of forecasting the future, they need to analyze the disasters of the past. Naked Science next explores the planet's greatest ever earthquakes. Naked Science is examining the awesome power of earthquakes. So far, we have learned that if a large earthquake was to hit one of the world's megacities, the human cost would be overwhelming, with the potential to claim millions of lives. Earthquakes through history have shown just how great the death toll can be. America's deadliest earthquake occurred in 1906. 
It's April 18th, and San Francisco is hit by an estimated magnitude 8.3 quake. The quake itself is devastating. But it's the resulting firestorm, lasting four days, that totally destroys the city and kills more than 3,000 people. But the highest ever body count has come from earthquakes in China. One 16th century earthquake reputedly killed almost 850,000 people. And more recently, the great Tungshan earthquake of 1976 measured a magnitude eight on the Richter scale. It killed three quarters of a million as many as live in the U.S. cities of Miami and St. Louis combined. Earthquakes take their toll in other ways, too. Livelihoods are destroyed and economies ruined. The costliest earthquake of all time happened in Japan in 1995. Early one January morning, the city of Kobe is struck by a 6.9 earthquake. In less than 30 seconds, at least 120,000 buildings are destroyed. More than 5,000 are killed, and around 300,000 people left homeless. The Japanese city is rocked for just 20 seconds, yet the quake causes $200 billion worth of property damage. The Kobe and Tungshan earthquakes were so costly in human and financial terms because they hit heavily populated, industrialized cities. The most powerful earthquake ever occurred off the coast of Chile. In contrast, it claimed 2,000 lives and did just a half a billion dollars worth of damage. The 1960 quake measured a stunning 9.5 on the Richter scale. But the United States has a history of massive earthquakes, too. The most powerful ever recorded hitting the U.S. was also in a relatively unpopulated area. In 1964, a magnitude 9.2 struck Alaska near the city of Anchorage. It was second in size to Chile's world record quake. In America, the average strong earthquake in the past century lasts just 30 seconds. But the Alaska earthquake, traveling along a fault line over 2,000 miles long, lasts 14 times longer than that. For more than 400 seconds. It literally shook the whole area to the ground. One town was totally obliterated by the quake, but its doom had as much to do with the type of land it was built on as with the power of the quake itself. Situated at the base of a glacier, the small Alaskan waterfront town of Valdez was a disaster waiting to happen. Built on saturated fine-grained soils, it had no chance of survival. The soft ground exaggerated the earthquake's movements, leaving Valdez a broken mass of rubble and destruction. Two survivors of that disaster, mother and daughter Gloria Day and Linda Guthrie, will never forget how their world tore apart. The people there were fishermen, some old pioneers. They had false front buildings and wooden sidewalks and um, it was a close-knit little community. That afternoon, the steamship China docks on the main pier. The ship is carrying the first supplies of fresh fruit and goods of the year. There wasn't a lot of entertainment in Old Town, so, so it was a big thing when the ship came in. All the kids go down to the dock when the ship comes in because the cook on the ship makes candy and makes cookies and things like that for them. At 5.30, as the ship is tying up, the town is shaken by a tremor. Normally when we have a tremor, it'll be 15 seconds. 
a minute at the most. And this one just kept going on and on and on. It keeps going on and on and on for an astonishing seven minutes. I could hear the nails pulling out of the boards in the house, so I got scared and started to run down the stairways. The movement bounced me off the walls going down the stairs. The pickup was sitting in front of the house and it was rolling back and forth two or three feet. I remember thinking that we were sinking or thinking it was the end of the world. The town stands on unstable sand and gravel. When the huge quake hits, the shock waves shake the unconsolidated ground so violently that virtually the entire town collapses. I was scared to death. I didn't think it was going to stop, and I thought it was the end of the world. That land at the waterfront opened up like a submarine landslide. You could see the china from our house up in the air. Within seconds, the pier collapses, and the sea engulfs the dock, swallowing everything. The entire waterfront is pulled into the sea. And the longshoremen and people that were down there on the dock just disappeared. Then the local oil tanks rupture, causing a fast-spreading fire that destroys most buildings left standing from the quake. Entire families perish. Soon afterwards, the town is deemed geologically unsafe. Nothing will be built here again. The site is abandoned forever. There was a sense of awe. We knew that something had happened that was catastrophic. The survivors would never return. But why was Old Valdez completely obliterated by the earthquake? When a large earthquake shakes saturated land, the intense shaking can create a phenomenon called liquefaction. Liquefaction happens where the soil is lightly packed and wet. As the ground shakes, the saturated soil starts to behave like a liquid, and so acts like quicksand. Old Valdez was built on silty, water-drenched soil. It never had a chance of withstanding seven minutes of violent earthquake shaking. When you shake the sand, it's just like if you shook a canister of flour, you'd see the level sink down. Old Valdez literally sank into the ground. The new town of Valdez is built four miles away. Little remains of the original settlement, apart from a memorial to the 32 men, women, and children who lost their lives. Terrifyingly, there are major cities also built on unstable soil. Parts of Los Angeles and San Francisco will face serious liquefaction hazards if a big earthquake strikes. And both cities lie on areas loaded with active faults, including the San Andreas Fault, where the Pacific and North American plates grind past each other. It's not a crack, it's not a hole, it's rather the place where the two big plates come together and move past each other. You can see it through the landscape as a straight valley. The entire system is more than 800 miles long. It runs from 270 miles north of San Francisco and ends about 200 miles south of Los Angeles. The two main plates of the San Andreas Fault move in opposite directions to each other. Here in California, Los Angeles is moving towards San Francisco at about the same rate that most people's fingernails grow, about one and a half to two inches a year. The pressure built up by the moving plates 
is released by thousands of small tremors every year. Larger earthquakes are rare, but when they do happen, they are devastating. San Francisco is very near the San Andreas, and these big strike slip faults cause much more intense shaking very near the fault, and San Francisco is going to get the full brunt of that. The last major quake to hit San Francisco struck on October 17, 1989. That Tuesday, many residents are settling down to watch the San Francisco Giants take on the Oakland A's in the third game of the World Series. While many are glued to their TV sets, the quake strikes. For 15 seconds, a magnitude 7.1 quake rocks the San Francisco area. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. Power has been interrupted temporarily in the park. The Bay Bridge is damaged, and part of the Nimitz Freeway collapses. The quake injures over three and a half thousand people and causes massive damage to 20,000 buildings all over the Bay Area. Despite all this destruction, fatalities are relatively modest. 63 people lose their lives. City officials were stunned that so many apparently earthquake-proof structures had collapsed. The city of San Francisco had, after all, taken wide-ranging measures trying to ensure their buildings were earthquake-proof. Yet on a single block, one building had collapsed, while the one beside it had escaped untouched. It made little sense. When we return, Naked Science asks, why do some buildings collapse while others remain unscathed? Can we ever truly understand why and how earthquakes happen? Will we ever be able to predict them? And even if that proves possible, how will we protect ourselves from their devastating effects? In the United States and Japan, major cities under threat carry out extensive construction programs to try and make their buildings earthquake-proof. But even with these precautions in place, when an earthquake strikes, many buildings still collapse. In the earthquake that shook Kobe, Japan in 1995, more than 120,000 buildings were damaged. But not all the structures fell down. So why do some buildings collapse while others remain untouched? Some buildings collapse because of the effects of earthquake shock frequency, where mere vibrations can bring down a multi-story building. To illustrate how such a thing can happen, Dr. Lucy Jones uses the music frequencies created by a cello. Faults produce earthquakes for much the same reason that this string will produce a note when I push my bow on it. We can actually use the instrument and the music we make as an analogy for earthquakes. When two huge fault plates rub together, like a bow drawn across a string, the friction produces vibrations across a range of frequencies. In the case of earthquakes, the frequency produced depends on the length of the fault, just as the note produced on the instrument depends on the length of the string. Depending on their size and construction, every building resonates with a different frequency. When the earthquake frequency matches a building's frequency, the vibrations can cause it to shake even more violently than its neighbor, and eventually collapse. Across the US, many cities have tried to build structures that won't fall down. 
Los Angeles has put enormous effort into making the entire city as earthquake-proof as possible. But when California's last major quake rocked Los Angeles, once again, many buildings were shaken to the ground. January 17, 1994, 4.30 in the morning, the residents of the greater Los Angeles area received the ultimate wake-up call, a magnitude 6.7 earthquake. The city's emergency services race out to a city now disfigured with mangled ruins. They need help from anyone who has urban search and rescue training. One man with such training is Captain Wayne Ivers of the Los Angeles Fire Department. He was one of the first to the disaster zone. It was very surreal. There were broken gas mains that were on fire, and it pretty much looked like a war zone. One of the many buildings to crumble in the quake is a multi-story parking lot in Northridge. The huge structure, larger than two football fields, has collapsed. The only man there, street cleaner Salvador Peña, is trapped beneath the 20 tons of rubble. The three-story parking lot has fallen on top of him, pinning him inside his vehicle. Wayne Ibers was the senior firefighter at the scene. I thought, I don't know how we're gonna do this. The task appears overwhelming, but he has to come up with a plan quickly. First, they have to get into the flattened building. There was some breaks in the concrete. We had to widen those with jackhammers. Ibers and the team begin to strategically dismantle the many layers of concrete. They have to work fast. Ibers knows that every second counts. The rescue team has to crawl through the rubble in spaces just inches high. While the men are trying to locate Salvador, aftershocks threaten to bring everything down on top of them. Anytime you're working in a rubble, you're always concerned about a secondary collapse, killing you and your teammates. Iber's team carries on, knowing that a further collapse could happen at any moment. At last, they find the car. The first thing is to check the victim is breathing. Salvador's legs and right arm are trapped under the dashboard. He is alive, but losing strength. When I could see Mr. Pena, I couldn't believe he was alive. Ibers has to constantly check that the area is safe enough for his team to continue working. The vehicle's gas tank is ruptured. It's leaking fuel and is in danger of going up in flames. The fuel is cleared but it's vital for Salvador to be pulled to safety as soon as possible. Two massive concrete slabs have crushed the front and back of the car. The rescuers are in constant fear of the massive aftershocks. We had aftershocks in excess of five on the Richter scale. Those really got your attention. Outside, Paramedics are ready to whisk the injured man to the hospital. First, Salvador has to be extracted from the wreck of his car. Powerful airbags raise the crushing concrete by a few vital inches. Then, the specialist hydraulic cutters and other jaws of life get to work, cutting the vehicle apart. Get it with your cutters if you can. Iber's major worry is that in the process of trying to rescue Salvador, he might actually kill him. He knows that relieving the weight off Salvador's compressed legs could cause crush syndrome, a condition that can lead to shock, kidney failure, and death. Gonna raise him up a little bit, Mike? Get him out of here. 
Salvador is finally pulled free. His thighs have been crushed to just two inches in width, but he survives, and doctors are able to save Salvador's legs. Even more amazingly, he doesn't have a broken bone in his body. I think the thing that drives us into situations like that is the overwhelming desire to help and to make a difference for somebody that can't help themselves. Many other buildings collapsed in the earthquake, and many other victims were less fortunate than Salvador. 57 people died, and 9,000 were seriously injured. And with the constant movement of tectonic plates, it's only a matter of time before another strong quake hits a major city. So what can we do to prepare ourselves for when the next big one hits? Since the Los Angeles quake of 94, building codes have been tightened. Responses to a massive megacity earthquake are being improved. New facilities are being built to train rescuers. At College Station, Texas, a state-of-the-art mini-city has been specially designed. Disaster City is the home of the Emergency Operations Training Center. This training facility has been designed to replicate exactly what urban search and rescue teams will encounter when they enter a disaster zone. Established in the year 2000, the $6 million site covers 52 acres. Every year, it trains hundreds of rescue specialists from all over the world. The base also has an international rescue team on constant standby capable of preparing equipment within minutes and flying to any part of the world to help in search and rescue efforts. The terrible, instantly destructive nature of earthquakes is clear. But earthquakes also pose other, less immediately obvious dangers. To learn of these, Naked Science meets Professor Costas Sinalakis in California. What we discover from him is alarming. Earthquakes are catalysts for another deadly force, the overwhelming power of tsunami. Now this is the part of the show we warned you about earlier. Are you ready to get wet? Naked science has learned that another one of nature's most deadly natural phenomena, the tsunami, can be triggered by the awesome power of an earthquake under the sea. The antics of a performing killer whale are used as an analogy for how this can happen by tsunami expert Professor Costas Sinalakis. When we see a killer wave that's jumping out of the water, falling down, we see a huge circular wave. This is very similar to what happens when an earthquake rips the seafloor. That circular wave is created by the massive impact of Shamu, the five-ton killer whale landing flat out on the surface of the pool. The massive jolt displaces a huge volume of water that has to go somewhere. Similarly, when an earthquake jolts the Earth's crust upwards under the seabed, the same sort of circular wave is formed in the ocean waters above. Like throwing a giant boulder into a pond, the water forms a wave that radiates out in all directions. The difference is one of scale and power and speed. In the deep ocean, tsunami will move incredibly fast. It can reach 500 miles per hour. Tsunami lose hardly any of their power as they travel through the deep waters of the open ocean. But approaching the shallower water close to land, the huge waves slow down and increase in height. When they reach land, even after traversing an ocean, 
the result can be catastrophic. Tsunamis are a very underrated hazard. In the past half century, tsunamis have killed more people in the United States than all the earthquakes combined. People can be sitting on a beach totally unsuspecting. And then suddenly, a tsunami will come in and everyone who is sitting on the beach will get completely destroyed. Tsunami happen in all the world's oceans, but are most common in the Pacific, around the Ring of Fire. Small tsunami are common, but waves of 100 feet or more have been recorded on rare occasions. The largest earthquake ever recorded in 1960 in Chile sent an enormous tsunami across the Pacific Ocean. The wave traveled halfway around the world in just 22 hours, engulfing the coast of Japan. The United States, too, has suffered the terrifying effects of the tsunami. The last major one to hit the U.S. mainland arrived in 1964. The huge earthquake that rattled Alaska generated a series of giant tsunami. The waves climbed to heights of more than 220 feet, as high as a 31-story building. Moving at high speed, they reached as far south as Crescent City in California, devastating 29 city blocks and killing 11 people. The effects of the wave were seen as far away as South Africa. But in 1998, another tsunami totally changed how scientists study these devastating waves. Up until 1998, we thought that all giant tsunamis were generated by big earthquakes, like the 1964 Alaskan earthquake. But in 1998, a relatively moderate earthquake in Papua New Guinea changed our entire perspective. July 17, 1998. A magnitude 7 quake rocks Papua New Guinea off the northeast coast of Australia. About 12,000 people inhabit the villages up and down the coastline, living close to the waterline in traditional wooden houses. Within minutes of the earthquake, a roaring noise is heard. People on the beach see the ocean dramatically recede. A mysterious dark line appears on the horizon. As the wave approaches, the villagers begin to run away, but too late. The 50-foot wave sweeps them all away, destroying the villages. More than 2,000 people die. What astonishes the scientists is the fact that a relatively modest quake could cause such a devastating wave. Scientists had previously thought that tsunami could only be caused by huge earthquakes directly under the seabed. Here we have an earthquake, the likes of which we get somewhere around the world once a week. And it generates a huge wave. And then the question is why? At Papua New Guinea, the earthquake epicenter was on land, not underwater. But the shock waves rippled offshore, setting off a massive underwater landslide. Sediment and rock spewed across the ocean floor, displacing vast quantities of water, 
and almost certainly creating the wave. But could this happen elsewhere? Papua New Guinea made scientists take a fresh look at coastlines around the world, seeking similar offshore formations. Their research led to a chilling discovery. They identified many places off California very similar to the Papua New Guinea coastline. Off San Diego, off Los Angeles, off Santa Barbara, in Monterey Bay. Just a few miles off the coast of California lies a multitude of similar unstable underwater canyons. Scientists are worried that small quakes along the San Andreas Fault could cause any of these underwater canyons to collapse and create a major tsunami. How likely is it that a tsunami will strike here? The dangers for tsunami in California are very real. I'm afraid that within my lifetime, we're going to experience a tsunami in California. It is not clear how big this tsunami will be, but uh, there is a clear danger. A network of detection devices is in place, but their warnings may come too late. An earthquake-triggered tsunami could reach the coast in minutes. Only predicting the earthquake itself could offer any hope for this coastline. How possible is that? Predicting earthquakes is very hard. Predicting tsunamis is even harder. If we had reliable ways to predict earthquakes, then we could predict when a tsunami strikes, and this would give us extra warning time to evacuate more people off the beach, and then we would save many more lives. An earthquake-generated tsunami could happen at any time. Science must develop techniques that will predict such an event. Naked Science's next stop is UCLA, where this man is working on a formula that has the scientific world talking. Could he have found the answer to how earthquakes may be predicted? Naked Science is looking at the science of earthquakes. So far, we know where and why earthquakes happen, and that more than 100 million people in the world's megacities live in constant danger of a catastrophic quake. With accurate earthquake predictions, cities could be evacuated and rescue services placed on high alert. But understanding the seemingly random behavior of earthquakes remains an elusive goal. Humans have tried to foresee earthquakes for thousands of years. In the ancient world, animals and fish were watched for any change in behavior that would give clues to a coming disaster. But although some research suggests that animals may change their behavior before a major earthquake, it is, to say the least, an unreliable method. Serious scientific study into prediction only began in the 1970s. Scientists back then investigated various methods of prediction. Some thought for a while they had cracked it. They carried on with wild and wonderful theories, but remained dogged by the inconsistency of their results. Nobody's had repeatable success. Some people have been lucky, but nobody's been lucky twice. Until recently, science seemed no closer to finding a reliable method. 
The current technique relies on analyzing the past activity of known faults. We can tell where they're most likely, what magnitude we're likely to have, what the consequences of any of those earthquakes are. Experts are convinced that an earthquake will hit Los Angeles or Tokyo because they have done repeatedly in the past. The problem is when and how big will it be? Most scientists still believe that earthquakes are impossible to predict. But there could now be a major breakthrough. One of the world's leading seismologists is challenging the accepted thinking in earthquake prediction. <laughs> Professor Vladimir Kelis Borok is Russian and still speaks with the sounds of his native tongue. He look at the symptoms of approaching earthquake like doctor looking at the symptoms of disease. He heads an international research team made up of experts in pattern recognition, geosciences, seismology, and chaos theory from institutions around the world. He's spent over 20 years fine-tuning and honing his revolutionary technique. His method is quite simple. He's worked out a formula to predict earthquakes. To get a result, he feeds into the formula the number, size, and frequency of earth vibrations in a given area. The result that the calculation comes up with gives the location and a ballpark date of the earthquake. The formula is being continuously fine-tuned. In the future, he hopes to pinpoint the date of an earthquake to within weeks or even days. But the theory is controversial. I'm a scientist. I always believe that knowledge is better than no knowledge. And if we could do it, I want to do it, and I'd like to find ways in which we can use it. There's been heated debate, but at the moment, the kellis borok theory is the only viable option that science can offer. Has he found the scientific holy grail? So far, he and his team have had very positive results. In June 2003, his team predicted that an earthquake measuring magnitude 6.4 would strike Central California within nine months. Six months later, a 6.5 did strike San Simeon. And then they predicted a magnitude 7 in the Hokkaido region of Japan. Less than three months later, an even larger quake struck. The Kellis Borok team had hit the earthquake prediction jackpot. But was it no more than blind luck? Fellow seismologists suggest that Kellis Borok needs to make at least 10 accurate predictions before the results can be deemed scientifically reliable. It's just a matter of time before we will know if his theory is right. I do not know if Dr. Kielis Borok will prove correct. I hope he's correct, because if he's correct, it means prediction is possible. And I'd love that to be true, but I don't know yet. We have seen the terrible threats that earthquakes pose to human life. The dangers to our megacities. We can't control earthquakes. But science is at last attempting to predict their arrival. Success would offer real hope for the future.